Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber, and we have a special guest with us today, David Fellman. And David is a uh, return speaker to our conference. So how are you doing today, David? I'm good, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you. Um, David um, is a um, senior software engineer, and through his personal journey, journey uh, looking at uh, health and diet, he, using his engineering skills, uh, found a pattern in um, cholesterol profiles that um, has now led to a new light in terms of our understanding regarding cholesterol and heart disease. And uh, it's actually Dave, through his research, who has coined the term for which he's famous, lean mass hyperresponder. And uh, that has been cited in the literature over and over again. And congrats on, on that, David. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. yeah, so you know, if you can just start and give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself, how you got interested, and um, also uh, what your, pers your personal interests and your professional interests are at this time. Sure. So uh, first of all, I mean, really, my journey kind of started um, when I had gotten an A1C of 6.1 the second year in a row. This was back in 2015 uh, that I got the second A1C of 6.1, which, as you know, is a marker for prediabetes. At that point, I went to diabe diabetic forums, found this LCHF, low carb, high fat, and, and got very excited to try it out for myself. And, and when I did, I inspired both my dad and my sister to do so likewise. And all three of us were on it for about half a year. And... I had done a little bit of my homework, found out that there was, in some cases, people seeing their cholesterol go up, but that apparently was very rare. And when it did, it was usually referred to as being a hyper responder. It just sounded like a, a very odd circumstance where it would occur. Well, both my dad and my sister got their cholesterol levels back first. And after six months, they had hardly seen their cholesterol move at all, but not me. About seven months, a month after they had gotten theirs, I saw that my cholesterol went through the roof. And that kind of began the whole origin story, as it were. I became obsessed with learning uh, lipidology. That's the study of lipids. And um, as you just mentioned, and as was the first talk that I gave that kind of put me on the map at this, this little conference called Low Carb Breckenridge, um, I sure enough um, elucidated how this became sort of an obsession of mine. And I started doing a number of experiments where I was uh, getting my own cholesterol levels, eating to different diet plans, and sort of elucidating these early beginnings of what I now refer to as the lipid energy model, uh, which hopefully will help to kind of explain this system, because I think uh, it relates to many things from where I come from with software engineering, and that I think the thing that moves cholesterol around in our body is a network, much like, you know, what I've worked on long before this point, except far more sophisticated than anything I've ever programmed. Well, it's great, David, that you're you're in the circle now, and uh, it turns out that there's quite a few engineers that uh, are in these circles because they they understand that there's really a, a connection looking at the root causes and um, and you know the term biohacking, if you were uh, trying to understand it for yourself, it was this uh, discovery. Uh, your intervention initially to lower your A1C was, I believe, going on a low carb diet and then your LDL, LDL went through the roof. But of course, not the fret. And uh, you, you know this as well as I, that th there are actually quite a few uh, individuals that uh, change their dietary patterns and uh, they see this lean mass hyper uh, responder response. And, you know, as a physician, we, we'd seen that for years, but it was really when uh, we had first met you back in 2016 at our first conference there in in, uh, in Vail, actually, it was Vail, the first conference, that uh, you began to elic elucidate and to help us to understand exactly what's going on with uh, this 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 whole uh, cholesterol uh, issue and, and um you know, whether or not your heart's going to explode when you see the LDL go up like that on a low carb diet. Yeah, well, and I had felt some sense of nostalgia. I mean, of course, I um, called back to low carb Breckenridge. And as you said, low carb Vale preceded low carb Breckenridge. 
uh, as, as you recount and as many do at that time, I was showing up with my laptop kind of constantly trying to get people to look at my spreadsheets. And, you know, I had these ideas at the time, but they weren't very well formed. And just was what you just mentioned, lean mass hyperresponder, that term was actually uh, something that I was codifying and wrote an article about in July of 2017. But as you just mentioned, a, a lot of times there's pattern recognition that we see as a population of people who are interested in the patterns that are emerging. Metabolic syndrome is a good example from the other side of the fence. Metabolic syndrome is really just a pattern of five different uh, markers that when combined tend to be characteristic of a disease state, you know, originally I believe was called syndrome X and that we're now calling metabolic syndrome, rightly so, because it tends to be some kind of uh, dysfunction of metabolism. Well, in the same way, lean mass hyperresponders, it was more than just having a high LDL. It was this pattern, this triad, a combination of three lipid markers that oftentimes you'd see this high LDL go alongside what's normally considered good cardiovascular risk markers in having high HDL and low triglycerides, which by the way, are the opposite of what we see in metabolic syndrome. And that pattern, that pattern recognition in helping to kind of identify it, we had many more physicians like yourself who'd go, oh, actually, yes, now that you talk about it, there are some patients that I have. And more and more of those patients would bring back through social media, uh, these patterns, which would help us get those early starts in understanding what was going on and to try to kind of piece these puzzles, at, uh, get these puzzle pieces together, as it were. Yeah, and so one of the issues is that uh, your research uh, is there to uh, both educate, but to also challenge the medical authority because, you know, traditionally when it comes to health, we were trained as healthcare professionals to specifically and simply look at LDL cholesterol as a measurement of health. And so, you know, the goal was to get LDL as, as low as possible regardless of anything else. And, uh, you know, of course, I've been involved with this for over 23 years. And, you know, I, I challenged what, what I was seeing way back then. And, it, and, and again, um, you're bringing it to light today. And your work is now being researched and published. And um, that sends, a, a, you know, a strong message to um, education, you know, that uh, we, we, we can look at uh, some real research. I know it's an, it's an ongoing process, but, um, you know, what we've come to realize is that um, the, the hyper responders, as you call them, that it's one of the markers in the metabolic syndrome, syndrome X, also we call it the insulin resistance syndrome. And, you know, what we observe clinically in the office is that uh, these patients um, we help them lose weight or we're addressing prediabetes and all their metabolic markers, their, their prediabetes improves, their insulin, their glucose, their HbA1c, their inflammatory markers get better. Their HDL goes up in a good way. Their triglycerides go down in a good way. And we have this one marker, LDL cholesterol, that in some shoots through the roof. And we also follow patients with heart calcium scores. Um, and since we've done this for a while, uh, now 10 plus, 10, 20 years, and we really see favorable results in terms of um, heart calcium scores. And so there's this disconnect between the LDL cholesterol with these patients, heart calcium scores, and diets. And so, you know, your work, and I want to really dive into it, and that is um, through the Citizen Scientist Initiative. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about... Uh, what you've been doing and where you're going. Uh, yeah, well, and that's a big part of it is a lot of clinicians would talk to me about this consideration. In fact, um, I, I'm sure, you know, easily one of the most influential people on my life was Sarah Hallberg. And I met her at Low Carb Vale. Uh, I even shared a, a story and a couple of talks on how she was instrumental in helping connect me with a number of lipidologists. But it, it is a challenge for the reasons that you described, which is that in the field of lipidology right now, there's little left from their perspective to elucidate 
it's not a whether it's not whether high LDL is concerning or not. It absolutely is from modern medical perspective. It's you know what actions should be taken to lower it. And I should give deference and say that we don't know what we don't know. So it's certainly possible. And I think it's a defensible position to say, hey, wait a sec, maybe there is still a risk and we just haven't determined to what degree that there's risk in the increase of LDL. But part of what I'm trying to bring forward with this research, and um, as you mentioned with the Citizen Science Foundation, is to look specifically at these lean mass hyperresponders. Because part of the problem, Jeff, is that virtually all of our research that associates high LDL with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is of course the, the buildup of plaque in the arteries, comes from populations that have some form of dysfunction in their lipid metabolism, either when they're born with, such as familial hypercholesterolemia, or one that they acquire, such as what we just described, you know, insulin resistance syndrome, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. We, we haven't really done a lot of study thus far in an exclusively metabolically healthy population with high LDL. And this is where it's kind of an unusual opportunity from a scientific standpoint, because up until now, the available data of those folks who would have high LDL, but otherwise be metabolically healthy, uh, they might have an LDL of say, you know, 150 or 180 perhaps, right? But I'm sure you right now know, just as I do, many people will have LDL in the hundreds and not necessarily because they're comfortable with it or they're just casting aside the concern level. A lot of times it's for, it's for health reasons themselves, such as they're uh, epileptic or they have severe ulcerative colitis and just have a difficulty, you know, digesting fiber or many forms of carbohydrates. And so it's for those folks that I think we really need to get this research out the most. And, and so I formed the Citizen Science Foundation uh, in 2019 to start raising money to do exactly that, to get a study around lean mass hyperresponders, those folks who see the highest levels of LDL, but who through our criteria otherwise have excellent cardiovascular risk markers. They don't just have the high HDL and low triglycerides. They don't have, say, history of diabetes or other forms of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, you know, it'd be more likely to be approved by an IRB, which we did get. And then sure enough, you know, we've actually initiated the study and it's now ongoing. So I'm excited because we're finally going to get some data to really kind of nail down how relevant this really is from a risk standpoint, not just in not just in the context of good metabolic health, but in particular for low carbers. Yes, David. Well, um, thanks for sharing that with us. And, uh, you know, I think in medical research, they, they look at these people with high LDLs as um, kind of falling out outside, they're outsiders. And, and then they have FH and, and they're really at, at risk. And, and, and so your research is really looking at a specific population, as you said, a healthy population that's addressing diet and lifestyle. And then we see these metabolic changes and it would be most important for the readers and the audience to understand that the, the research is very specific for a healthy subset of population that tends to have high LDL cholesterol. So, um, you know, I know you have just a, a wonderful group of um, researchers, including Matt Budoff, who um, I've actually had the opportunity to meet uh, several years back. We had done an interview with him, but um, I was surprised to, to see him in, uh, in, in your group of researchers. And, you know, for the audience, he's actually... Uh, one of the, the founders of the, the heart calcium scores. He's very fond of heart calcium scores. And uh, I didn't know he had an interest in, in the lean mass hyperresponder research. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you recruited him? Uh, sure. And to be fair, it's I almost would feel guilty saying recruited him because when we met, it was as much him interviewing us <laughs> as it was me asking after him because what it came down to was he i i think matt exhibits many of the qualities that i've certainly been looking for in researchers to partner with and that he he really is genuinely a curious soul uh he he didn't come with a lot of expectations he came with a lot of questions and a lot of times um 
and I want to be fair to a lot of lipidologists and cardiologists, there's a foundation of knowledge for which, again, it's expected that a lot of these questions already have answers. That, hey, maybe there's this new context, but a lot of the, the crucial uh, pillars of the lipid hypothesis have been so established that many of them just weren't even interested in getting this study going. And that was part of the challenge initially before I started crowdfunding it. But then we eventually came across uh, Matt Budoff, who, by the way, just to give you a sense of his gravitas, he, he has over 1,200 papers to his name. In fact, I think if he's not the foremost, he's at least in the top three or four for, foremost CT experts with regard, to, um, with regard to research behind him. It's just incredible. And yeah, I, he put it fairly plainly, which is just that if, if we already had an eligibility criteria for this study where folks were showing up and they already had two years at the level of LDL that we were going to have at say 190 or 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, then they already should be exhibiting a higher level of plaque. But then on top of that, we'll do a longitudinal study. We were originally thinking it, we would need five years between when a first scan happened and when we we're gonna do a successive second scan. And through his expertise, he explained that, no, actually we only need one year given the level of exposure. Uh, because again, a lot of times people think that say an LDL of 200 is you know, twice as bad as an LDL of 100. But per the conventional lipid hypothesis, it's several fold. It kind of goes in an exponential rate and particularly for the higher it is and the longer it is, well, if it's really high, it doesn't take that long to actually see progression of plaque with the kinds of scans we're doing, which are CT angiograms. So it's not like we're waiting for people to develop symptomatic heart disease. We're literally getting a high resolution CT angiography. And that's what he's an expert in, which is why he was able to educate us on how best to conduct this study. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, Dr. Budoff recruited himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you you had enough data to to really make make an argument, to, and 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 again, not to diminish the the other co-authors and researchers, but uh, it's just a great team that you put together. So I know that over the years you've been recruiting individuals, and in, in, in fact, several of my patients have uh, actually signed up for um, uh, the research. And um, tell us about. You know, how, what are the criteria to re recruit? How many individuals are, are in this study and are you still recruiting? Yes. In fact, I'll use this opportunity to turn this into a plug because we are still recruiting. And if you're watching this now and you don't see that we've closed recruitment, then please consider this. Uh, if you or somebody you know has the following, an LDL of 160 milligrams per deciliter before having started a low-carb or ketogenic diet, who saw an increase of 50% or greater to an LDL level of 190 milligrams per deciliter or above. And you have an HDL cholesterol of 60 or higher and a triglycerides of 80 or lower currently. Then those are the major eligibility criteria on top of um, preferably having been uh, on the ketogenic diet or low-carb diet for at least two or more years. That's the major eligibility criteria. There are more, but at that point, you know, you should definitely reach out to lmhrstudy.com, as in lean mass hyperresponder, lmhrstudy.com. It'll take you to our IRB approved page. And from there, you can, you can look further. Now, let me explain why we wanted that criteria. So as you could probably guess, Jeff, um, we're, we're intentionally trying to exclude folks who may have a genetic predisposition to having higher LDL. Those, as I mentioned earlier, who have familial hypercholesterolemia, because that again, brings us back to the question of potentially dysfunctional lipid metabolism, for which by the way, lipid lowering therapy may be very efficacious and they may wanna consider that. Um, but if they saw, and, and for what it's worth, our, our study includes genetic testing. So we'll confirm or disconfirm if there's uh, molecular genetic, um, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. But yes, we want to recruit these folks. We're going to recruit a total of 100. And as of this moment, we're, I want to say over three-fourths of the way recruited. So we still have more recruitment to go. 
Uh, and I want to close it up soon, hopefully within like the next month or two. And yes, as I mentioned before, everyone's uh, getting a CT angiogram. We fly them to UCLA where they will actually stay overnight, be fully fasted, get wide spectrum blood testing, uh, genetic testing, and a CT angiogram all paid for by us. And they'll, they'll have that data for themselves and the doctor, of course. And then one year later from when they took their first scan, we'll fly them back to get the second angiography. And at that point, they can, uh, we can compare those scans at a population level. We're interested in particular in non-calcified plaque progression. Uh, as you know, calcification is of a lot of interest, but A, it doesn't necessarily move as quickly, and B, it also can be sort of downstream of, you know, what many believe, and myself included, could be a perpetual healing process to an extent. So what's more of interest to us is non-calcified plaque regression, which we think is of more immediate concern if you're actually seeing that at a, at a you know, at a high level. Um, and that's, that's basically the basis of the study. Yeah. Well, I was actually a little surprised to see that you're looking at non-calcified, uh, but you just explained why uh, that's, that's, that's important. And you actually need CT angiogram to, to look for soft plaque, to look for obstruction rather than a, a heart cal calcium score by itself just looks for burden of uh, calcium. Uh, also, I, I did want to thank you for bringing up the issue about individuals that may actually have FH, and you really need to get genetic testing. It's not just a pattern. You have to get get the genetic testing to determine if, if you're at risk. And uh, I, I agree, again, medication might be something to consider in those individuals, as well as unhealthy individuals. So, you know, the, this isn't to say that... Uh, you know, we're anti-medication. We're just wanting to understand the science and trying to make, uh, trying to understand what to do with lean mass hyper responders and uh, that they're not necessarily treated in the conventional sense uh, in terms of individuals that might have FH or have the metabolic syndrome. The, uh, the other comment I wanted to make is that uh, Again, we have patients that are in your study and um, they've actually been sharing the data with, with us. And uh, we have been joking since you're blinded to the, the study, you know, you're gonna have to, you know, um, threaten me to get the, get the information, but uh, <laughs> we're following them. And, uh, uh, you know, when, when it's time to share, you'll, you'll, you'll know. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a challenge because you know we're we're an unusual creature as studies go. Those people who don't already know a lot of clinical trials. They tend to have a recruitment process where it's very rare for the participants to know each other, uh, much less for there to be some kind of almost excitement, almost event like status to the study itself. But that's exactly how you would describe this study. Lean mass hyperresponders is a community. Uh, we have a Facebook group. Uh, everyone's very tight, particularly the most active ones. Uh, so it's not uncommon for there to be some sharing. Um, I, I, I'll concede, I myself didn't actually know that they would get that information before the study was over. Um, but knowing that, I'm not too surprised that some participants have shared information exactly what you described. I should be as blinded as I can reasonably be, which is what I try to do. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't change that there are some participants who quite literally DM me and they're like, oh my gosh, this, this was the data that I got or something along those lines. Um, but it's, it is worth emphasizing something that is super important about this study, Jeff, that I'm sure you'll agree with, which is that we're in a space in nutrition, especially for which there are a lot of case series and there are a lot of anecdotes. And the problem with both of these is they potentially have the risk of selection bias. So whether conscious or unconscious, we like to see the patterns that fit our worldview. And we like to minimize the ones that don't because you know we assume they may not have done it right and we may be right about that or something along those lines. Prospective data, literally defining a cohort in advance and then gathering data from that cohort that has a special advantage in that it helps to prevent that selection bias. You know what that 
selection criteria is from the get-go. So the ability to include or exclude as you see fit is being limited on purpose. That's why this is so important is even though we have, you know, even greater levels of uh, inference from better um, study designs that I'm excited about, for the time being, I've just wanted prospective data on a population that given, you know, what we now know is um, at least so far our mean average is in the top 10% of the top 1% of the population of LDL. Uh, at least we can get some sense as to what their actual risk is from a from at least a broader perspective. You know, as I like to say, the horseshoes and hand grenades perspective. A lot of clinicians like yourself reach out to me all the time to just say, could you give me anything, just something at all, even if you can't get to the granular level yet? And I think these folks are long overdue for that data. Yeah. Well, that's great that the the researcher your group is trying to eliminate the selection bias and also the researcher bias. And generally the group is just curious to, to, to know what's going on. And um, yeah, look, I, I know you've published several papers, you know, what I wanted to do real quick right now, just to share my screen. And um, can you see that Dave? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so this is the, uh, the most recent paper that was uh, published this year, and I, I believe it's a hypothesis paper looking at the lipid energy model. And you know, I just bring this up to have you comment on this, uh, perhaps to get into the mechanism briefly, because I know you can just go on all day with this. <laughs> <laughs> But just to briefly explain what's going on metabolically and also in the research, you know, you're really at a point where you have enough data to present the hypothesis in this particular paper. But uh, I guess the next step in the future in the research is to uh, demonstrate what happens in terms of cardiovascular risk to these hyper responders. And that's not what this paper addresses, if I am correct. Correct. Well, I got to make another correction too. Technically, there's been a paper since this one. It's my first, first author. Um, I was excited to be able to be senior author for the lipid energy model. And I do want to, I do want to say um, mega props to all of my co-authors on that paper, but I want to give a special shout out to Nick Norwitz. Nick Norwitz has been uh, especially instrumental for helping us move a lot of this toward the literature. Uh, yes, so I'm going to do my best to sort of turn this into a layperson explanation, um, but when we talk about metabolic health, because you hear the term all the time, especially in our space, uh, I like to get a little bit more specific. I tend to think of it as this counterbalance between anabolism, which is the building up of stuff, and catabolism, which is the breaking down of stuff. And the stuff we're most interested in with metabolism is fuel. Well, if you're powered more by fat, then you need to be able to store fat well, and you need to be able to take fat out pretty well. And oftentimes, a strong indicator of that is your HDL and your triglyceride levels because uh, HDL tends to be higher and triglycerides tend to be lower. The better you are at doing exactly what I described, putting the fat away and pulling it back out, whether you're on a low carb diet or not. Well, in the case of the lipid energy model, as you know, the first and, and perhaps most eye-catching thing that I was doing and showing at Low Carb Breckenridge five and a half years ago was how unintuitive it was that I could consume a huge amount of a ketogenic diet, high in saturated fat at a high caloric load, like say, you know, 4,000 or 5,000 calories. And in the immediate aftermath of that, literally within just a few days, you'd see my, my LDL cholesterol plummet. It would just go straight down. Right. But then on top of that, I didn't understand this at the time, Jeff, but we also saw my HDL would go up and my triglycerides would go down acutely as well. So while that typically happened at baseline from just being on a ketogenic diet, it happened even more so when I was over consuming. And what I didn't realize then, but now understand better, or at least what I posit more with the current lipid energy models, what's really going on is it's just that process 
of working with adipocytes, the fat cells themselves. I am quite literally depositing more of those triglycerides that I would argue are being trafficked around in these boats that we make. Even back then I was calling them boats, these lipoproteins or lipid carrying proteins, because they're kind of at the center of this model. In short, what has to happen in order to do that counterbalancing between the anabolism and the catabolism is a process. And it's a complicated process, one that I can't get into easily, but it has a ride sharing component to it. And what ride shares with that process of transportation in these boats are cholesterol. Cholesterol is a, a crucial component of lipoproteins to give them the right amount of structure and buoyancy so that they can move around. And in the case of what I was describing, where I was over consuming a food, you can actually, you're literally, I believe, depositing not only the cholesterol content in these boats to further expand these adipocytes, these fat cells, but on top of that, the lipoproteins themselves, which is why the particle count goes down. You can flip this script, by the way. If I instead fasted for the next two or three days, we would find all three of those things would go in reverse. My LDL would go up, my HDL would go down, and my triglycerides would go up. And that's actually because there's less engagement by those boats, those lipoproteins, in depositing the triglycerides while I'm going into a state of release, while my adipocytes are mainly letting loose those fatty acids into uh, the bloodstream to be made use of by my peripheral tissues, my oxidative tissues, and those things that need to be making use of it. And that's, that's really kind of at the heart of the energy model is if you're going to be powered by fat, then that's where the focus needs to be is in the, the storage and release of those uh, fatty acids from not only adipocytes, but as I'm sure you've seen me talk about in other uh, presentations as well, from what I colloquially could call the mobile adipocytes, which are the lipoproteins, those boats that carry them around, they also have the same surface as the adipocytes and really all of our cells with phospholipids and free cholesterol. And trying to think of them as trying to think of these things as single units is already part of the problem. I don't think that you can, just like I don't think you can look at lipid markers such as triglycerides, HDL or LDL in isolation. You have to look at them in combination. And that's what the lipid energy model tries to elucidate is what all of these different interacting components are and why that matters. Yeah. Oh, that's a great explanation. You know, I, I like to really simplify it to my patients and just say that, you know, lipoprotein transports energy around the body and uh, specifically um, fat soluble energy, uh, vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. And then somehow the heart association uh, kind of locked into uh, lipoprotein as a risk factor for heart disease some 50 years ago and never looked at what lipoprotein actually does in the body. And you just explained it quite well. Well, thanks. I mean, and to be fair, there's at another one of your conferences is when I first brought up remnants. Remnants are those lipoproteins that are not LDL, but are still ApoB. So all of these, all of these, um, I guess the best way I could put it is all of these lipoproteins that pr predominantly provide lipids, they're all ApoB, as in they all have this major large protein called ApoB that are a part of it. And I'll be talking about that at length at our next uh, conference. But those that are generally still enriched with lipids, and have not yet remodeled to LDL, they're called remnants. So you can almost think of remnants as all ApoB lipoproteins that are not LDL, so this whole other category. And why that's very relevant to me and why I believe it has such a high association with cardiovascular risk when you do have a large number of remnants, which by the way, a good proxy for that is triglycerides. If you have a lot of triglycerides, it's because you have a lot of remnants. It's because I think it it's, it's largely likely that it's due to a failure of delivery. Now you have a failure breakdown in the system of delivering these triglycerides, either to your adipocytes or to your oxidative tissues, such that they're remaining in circulation. So they're failing to find parking for where they would otherwise be normally 
providing not just the triglycerides, but as you just mentioned, the fat soluble vitamins and other lipids that cells make use of. And I think that that's a, a crucial piece of the puzzle. Like why not start with folks who have high levels of ApoB containing lipoproteins, high here, but low levels of remnants, low triglycerides and high HDL, all but guarantees that you're gonna have low remnants so that we can, we can isolate the variable of interest that's assumed to be atherogenic in that context, in that systemic context. Are there uh, mechanisms that uh, describe uh, uh, a defect in the processing of remnants? Oh, many, many. And, and it's very important to the research in that. So let me give you an example. If you've read the lipid energy model, you know that a uh, piece I haven't gotten into yet is the thing that facilitates that transference, uh, which is called lipoprotein lipase. So lipoprotein lipase gets this process going where these lipids are coming off of the ApoB. And by the way, beyond just delivering some of those into the cell, also many of the surface components of the ApoB transfer over to the HDL particle um, you know, fleet, if you will. They're, they're kind of like the boats on standby ready to pick them up. Yeah. A very layperson way I like to explain it is ApoB's job is to start lipid rich and to become lipid poor. Whereas HDL or ApoA1, its job is to start small and to become lipid rich, to become big, right? And that's why, by the way, I think metabolic syndrome is indicative of such cardiovascular risk because what do you have? You have a lot of small HDL particles that are not getting lipid rich, which I think are, are indicative of a failure. It's, there's a failure of that turnover that's facilitated by lipoprotein lipase. Well, lipoprotein lipase is generally expressed on either adipocytes that are working properly and have plenty of storage or oxidative tissues that need them and will succeed at turning them over, right? Well, so getting back to your original question, are there diseases, for example, of dysfunctional lipoprotein lipase? Yes. And do we see that they tend to carry things like cardiovascular risk? Absolutely. Same thing with receptors. Getting back to um, familial hypercholesterolemia, if there's receptor mutations or other dysfunctions in that process I just described, where you have a failure of the delivery of those lipids into cells, do you see lots of problems, particularly with cardiovascular disease? You definitely do, which is why that functional versus dysfunctional, I think, is a category we need to first draw the line on. And that's, that's super crucial because there's all these different diseases between um, each of those states that are part of this process that I think fall a little bit more into that explanation that I'm describing now. So, um, David, I, I know that uh, there's been more uh, remnant LDL cholesterol research and, uh, out there in the literature, and I'm, I'm going to give you uh, some credit for uh, pushing the remnant uh, issue. Oh, thanks. And actually, there's another one that, that's not been on other people's radar, but that I was talking about even back in 2018, which was uh, transcytosis, is now getting, to, getting a lot more uh, credit, and I think rightly so. And, and I don't mention this as a, as a kind of humble brag, but, but I really do want people to consider things like uh, scavenger receptors being on endothelial cells, the cells that line the vessel wall, and on macrophages, and the implications of their being there. To me, as an engineer, I'm like, hey, this, these are engineered to be a part of the immune response. Why do we want to assume endothelial cells would want to have nothing to do with modified LDL particles if they don't already have receptors literally built in and expressed? Why do damaged endothelial cells express more unmodified LDL receptors, the normal LDL receptors? Why would macrophages have LDL receptors and utilize those as well if that also isn't part of the process of the immune response, since that's what macrophages use as well? All of these questions, I think, are very important to be asking up front for these very reasons, which, again, always seems to lead back to the same road, which is let's study lean mass hyperresponders, because let's take it out of a disease state. If virtually all of our data 
are coming from disease populations, it's understandable why we could be so easily confused until we find a population that has high LDL, that has high ApoB while having low remnants, suggesting, you know, potentially good metabolic health, perhaps, right? until we can actually elucidate that. And in that sense, I mean, Jeff, I, I really do need to emphasize in many ways, this was kind of a confluence of coincidences that made this possible. And one of those is the rise of the ketogenic diet. Had I gone on a ketogenic diet when it wasn't that popular, then there wouldn't be the ability for this pattern recognition that would help further feed the model and build it up and so forth. So in that way, I have to say, I'm, I'm not only thankful for the rise in its popularity, but for many people like your patients that make this possible by sharing this data back. It's, it's truly a ground roots, uh, grassroots, I guess you could say, you know, revolution in science that's being fueled at, at that level, much more so. Uh, and that hopefully will have a bigger impact on the pathology in time. Well, it's just amazing that we have uh, engineers such as you that are uh, giving it a think, as they say. So again, it's great to have you in these circles. And just to your last point, um, I think there is a lot of mechanistic research out there to show how important uh, lipoprotein is to the immune system. Yes. Uh, well, oh my gosh. I, if you, <laughs> this is one of those cases where I'm like, I don't want to take up a whole nother 20 minutes, but I know you've had speakers in there. Uh, I think uh, Nadir Ali, uh, discusses this. I know, I, I think Paul Mason discusses this. Uh, certainly I've discussed this and uh, a big shout out to my colleague, Siobhan Huggins, who by the way, has a whole article on uh, cholesterol code that goes into a lot of these. There's there's not just, you know, binding to pathogens, they carry uh, alpha tocopherol, which uh, as we know is vitamin E. Um, it's often described as though these antioxidants are local to the lipoprotein, but I think they're part of the host defense. I do. And, you know, again, I think that we need more studies to elucidate these things, but I've often thought of them. And again, I'll do the usual caveat. This is a hypothesis. I've often thought of them as practically non-nucleated uh, immune cells. And that's why the, the story of the transcytosis is very relevant to me. How much is that, you know, sorry to get super geeky here, but how much is the transcytosis of non-modified lipoproteins a part of the process of what's known as uh, uh, phagocytosis, right? Which is immune cell capture. Like how much is it a dogpiling of the pathogens in the subendothelial space? I'm very curious about that. Um, but again, I think we still have to, to get the whole field to be curious about it. We have to first tackle this one core assumption, which is that high ApoB containing lipoproteins in circulation are at high risk no matter what. And, and only at the point where we can kind of bifurcate if it proves to be that it doesn't show that level of risk, can we kind of, you know, walk into this new frontier? Well, I love geeking out with you, David, but uh, we do have a short period of time. So yeah, thanks for being pithy on that. So um, just finishing up, uh, you know, I want to make it clear that you're not saying that everybody just can go on a low carb, high fat diet and eat a ton of fat and they're going to reduce their cardiovascular risk. Your research is simply looking at lean mass hyper responders. And, you know, I know from a clinical perspective, you know, not one diet fits all. And so um, the amount of fat, the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrate you consume is going to vary depending on lots of factors. And um, it's just that your research is looking currently at these hyper responders who tend to eat more fat? Uh, yeah, I mean, not necessarily that they eat more fat. In fact, um, for what it's worth, there are some lean mass hyper responders who might have say, you know, 100 grams of carbs a day or even 150 grams of carbs a day, but they are so athletic that per the lipid energy model, they actually still keep their hepatic glycogen stores lower relatively speaking, which activates those aspects of the model. But to your point, um, yes, oftentimes I do my best to try to emphasize to everyone, A, I don't know if they're truly at low risk or not. Even if there's a lot of anecdotal data that seems to be somewhat encouraging, this is why you do a study, right? Um, B, yes, we're focused a lot more on lean mass hyperresponders, less so on, on folks who may uh, still have some metabolic challenges that they're working through. 
But also that's where our research has been somewhat helpful. I should mention the very first paper that we're on describes what I'm sure you've seen in practice as well, which is that those folks who tend to be you know, morbidly obese or very overweight and they lose weight, but they don't, they don't quite get to, you know, gym rat fit state, state status, as it were, they're, not, they're less likely to see this hyper response where the, the response goes substantially higher. It tends to be those folks who were already somewhat metabolically healthy, who see uh, somewhat paradoxically in that people don't expect it, the highest levels of increased LDL. And the good news is per our first paper, for those who are uncomfortable with it and want to take steps to lower it, usually it is about just getting less keto and bringing in more carbohydrates to maintain higher levels of hepatic glycogen stores, because it could well be that, you know, the higher LDL is of concern. That's why we need to get the data back to know. So it's good news, both directions. If you're, if you're, if your biggest worry right now is that your LDL is going to go through the roof, but you have metabolic syndrome, I would say it's less likely given the data that we have right now that you're going to see your LDL jump through the roof. Um, conversely, if you're athletic and you're going keto, eh, it's a little more likely that you'll see it, but that there's probably something you can do about it if that's what you observe. Um, but that said, our focus is mainly on lean mass type responders, as you said, for the very reasons you described, which is that I think that we need to um, first see it shown in what we would otherwise assume would be a healthy context, that there isn't that level of risk before we can work our way backwards. Uh, uh, toward, you know, other um, cohorts. Yeah, that's great, David. So, you know, we stay tuned. I mean, you speak at a lot of events and you always have exciting news <laughs> at each and every one. And so we hope by uh, the time uh, our conference comes in February that you'll have more exciting news for us as this uh, research uh, moves on. Um, so thank you. And uh, just one last question is... Um, which I like to ask everybody is what do you enjoy about uh, coming to these uh, conferences in person face to face? You know, honestly, I, I think I never get tired of the individual, the individual story of overcoming. Um, I, I, I myself have never had to struggle through, you know, a lot of weight loss and regaining of health. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, an A1C of 6.1, I'm, I'm proud of myself for tackling it sooner, given how rampant type 2 diabetes is on my dad's side of the family, rather than waiting until I was at 6.6 and 7 and so on and so forth. But that, frankly, that doesn't inspire me to the same degree as when I go to like low carb Denver and some, somebody shares that they lost, you know, 130 pounds and they're running a marathon for the first time with their kids. And you can, you can see it in their eyes, how meaningful that is for them. Um, as much as I love to geek out and get into the, the, those stories, they have enormous inspiration uh, for me. And I, and I love that about conferences, being able to talk to people in person, um, you know, and, and finding out what their story is and how, uh, they've worked with it and how they've overcome. Um, because, because of the cholesterol research, I'm in touch with a lot of folks who are epileptics and they have some of the most incredible stories. And I'm, and that's another reason why I'm so thankful for keto coming up because as you know, keto was kind of lost. It was sort of not known, uh, particularly to epileptics for a long time. And um, it's amazing what kind of quality of life they've seen. Um, many of them, many of them being able to get off their meds entirely, some not so. Um, but some of, I mean, some of them are like in their fifties and sixties and have never enjoyed life like they do right now. And that's, it's hard, it's hard to even quantify that for people like you and me. Well, I share in those sentiments about going to the uh, conferences in person. Uh, so Dave, how can uh, our audience find out more about you and your work? Sure. Well, of course, uh, citizensciencefoundation.org is where you can follow the research closely. That's our more official site. Um, there's uh, cholesterolcode.com, which is kind of our hub for lots of our different um, endeavors, although you can see it, I don't keep it up to date as much as I used to. Um, you can follow me uh, at Real Dave Feldman on Twitter and uh, for what it's worth, there's also ownyourlabs.com, which all of my 
uh, partner share goes to Citizen Science Foundation. So we get to like regularly move through there. But that's also another endeavor of ours to increase citizen science because the data we're collecting there, people have the opportunity to opt in. Um, it's a, it's, sorry, it's a blood reseller service um, if people want to order blood privately. Uh, but you have the opportunity to opt in to uh, provide your anonymized data to our larger data pool, uh, which we want to eventually make available for both uh, formal and citizens, citizen researchers alike. I'll also add that if you go to cholesterolcode.com slash forward slash papers, uh, there's a, a great summary of, of all of David's papers, and he's also included some wonderful YouTubes that I would uh, encourage you to watch. They're very short and they explain the hypothesis and the mechanisms of um, the hyper responders. So, yeah, so to our audience, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, meeting with Dave Feldman today. Um, if you're interested in the conference, you can find out more about that at lowcarbconferences.com. So until next time, we'll, we'll see you then. Thanks, David. Thanks so much for having me.